Hello everyone, welcome to Young Adult Materials, it's list 757 for fall of 2018. It is week 14, yay! The week of November 27th, 2018, I hope you had a great break. I thought I was going to put a lecture up for you last week um, and realized I only had two lectures left, so I didn't. I hope you're not sad. I don't think you are. All right, we're going to carry on now. All right, our learning outcomes this week are you will be able to learn about short stories for young adults. And I'm going to give you some great examples of short stories and anthologies of short stories and novels that use short stories. We're going to learn about magazines for young adults and zines for young adults, though my 16-year-old uh, son has told me that zines are not a thing. So it's perhaps a little bit of an historical lesson. And we're going to learn about the Alex Award. Of course, there's a long history of short stories. They date back to the early 1800s with uh, Washington Irving, Nathaniel Hawthorne, Edgar Allan Poe, traditionally used for academic purposes in classrooms, which makes them a hard sell to YAs because they get beaten like a dead horse in English classrooms. And so those poor youths are like, blah, I don't want to read short stories. This started changing in the 1980s with theme-based collections. Donald Gallo is the godfather of contemporary YA short story collections. He wrote 16 in 1985, Visions in 88, and Connections in 1990. Hazel Rochman has several theme-based collections from the 1990s. One called Somehow Tenderness Survives from 88, Who Do You Think You Are? Stories of Friends and Enemies from 1993. There were some new kinds of anthologies in the 1990s, and I kind of missed these because I was a classroom teacher and I had um, my head sort of down concentrating on surviving in the classroom. Um, so anyway, these new anthologies were helpful to have a theme that grabs them and a cover that looks like them and some connection to them from one story to the next. So that's a quote from Hazel Rushman. In 1997, several were included on Yalsa's banned book and quick pick lists, which of course brought more attention to them. Well-known YA novelists started compiling them, including Harry Mazur, Lois Duncan, Judy Bloom, and Marilyn Singer. I hope that after this class you recognize most of those names. Some single author collections. Gary Soto wrote Baseball in April from 90. Chris Crutcher wrote Athletic Shorts in 91 and Angry Management in 2009. I will tell you that Athletic Shorts still gets checked out at my library, in part because I sell it, but um, it's fantastic. It's hilarious. Uh, David Almond, Francesca, or is it Francesca? Francesca Leah Block. I don't like her stuff, but if you do, sorry. Bruce Coville, Chris Lynch, Beverly Nadeau, and others. Margot Lanigan's Black Juice from 2006 was a Prince Honor title. I will tell you that still gets checked out at my library. And in fact, I think it came back like two days ago. So um, that's still current and relevant. Zombies vs. Unicorns is a great collection um, edited by Holly Black and Justine Larbalestier. Sorry, I can't ever say her name right. Um, it includes authors Carrie Ryan, Scott Westerfeld, Meg Cabot, Garth Nix, Libba Bray, and others. I will tell you in my, um, I've talked a lot about purchasing and making good purchasing, purchasing decisions. However, um, there's the ideal and the reality in that I have a lot of money and not enough time to make good decisions. So I bought this book based on the title alone because it made me laugh and it turned out to be an excellent purchase. Right, this, um, this book is recommended for middle school students, though you may also want to have it in your high school library. I do try to make sure I have high-low reads available in my library. So, Us in Progress, short stories about young Latinos by Lulu Delacre. I probably mispronounced her name too. I should have looked that up. Sorry. Okay. Delacre's collection challenges existing misconceptions by giving readers an intimate and varied look into what it is like to be young and Latino in the United States today. Like I said, it's great to have, one, you want to have diversity in your collection, both diversity as far as the characters and diversity as far as the reading level of your selections. So you want high quality stuff that is accessible to a wide variety of kids. Speaking of diversity, Flying Lessons and Other Stories is a nifty anthology with a wide um, range of authors. 
It's edited by Ellen O, who is the founder of, or the co-founder of We Need Diverse Books. I hope you have visited that site. It's pretty nifty. Ten stories by mostly well-known authors of diverse backgrounds present young protagonists dealing with common themes of growing up. Love, family, friendship, dreams, fitting in, being excluded, and learning life lessons along the way. If you're making a purchase right away, you might want to include this YA short story anthology. It has some um, edited by Stephanie Perkins, who is a best-selling YA author herself, but it includes multiple authors, some that you, I'm sure, know, particularly after this class. Um, some of the authors include Holly Black, Allie Carter, Matt De La Pena, uh, Rainbow Rowell, David Levithan, Jenny Han, Lainey Taylor, uh, it's, and others. So it's like a who's who among um, young adult authors. But it is 12 stories. It had lots of great reviews from Booklist, Kirkus, and School Library Journal. Um, I suspect, I have not read this one yet. It's, of course, on my TBR. Um, but if you like holiday stories, holiday movies, made for TV holiday specials, except for the drivel that's on Lifetime. Oh my God, I watched a couple of those over the break. I'm so sorry I did. I need to wash my eyeballs. Anyway, these are lovely stories with a holiday theme that you might want to see if you can pick up quickly to put out in your library before the holidays. Next up, let's talk about the novel as a collection of linked stories. There are multiple novels out there that have short stories that are connected, but you could read them individually. They're better if you read them together. Um, so I've given you some examples here. And the growing popularity, popularity of short stories with teens has led to this new literary form. This addresses, to some extent, the short attention span of teens. A lot of teens like to have a quick read. This is getting worse, in my opinion, this inability to focus, but... Um, there's probably another entire class I could teach on that. Anyway, these types of books must be read in order, kind of like a novel, but you could probably pluck out sections to read individually. Some, some examples, Bruce Brooks' What Hearts, it's a play in words, obviously, um, is told about one male character at four different important turning points in his life. Um, Chris Lynch has a book called White Church, which is kind of disturbing. But if you've ever read anything by Chris Lynch, everything he writes is freaking disturbing. I will tell you that. They always, I'm always like, what? Um, he's not an author that I enjoy, but a lot of boys do enjoy him um, as he sort of treads the line of decency. The characters very often make really bad moral decisions. Um, and E.R. Frank's Life is Funny is a set of stories about a group of different teenagers in either the Bronx or Brooklyn. I don't remember exactly. Sorry. Um, in New York City, let's say that. And um, having a variety of experiences. And of course, they're interlinked. So this tells us that the short story is proving to be a durable form because English teachers haven't completely ruined it yet. I tried when I was an English teacher, though. I promise. All right, picture books and young adults. I've already told you guys about um, using picture books to have kids read aloud and then visit the daycare across the street from my high school. That's been really effective. I just had a funny conversation with a um, teacher at my school who's like, I don't know why I don't use picture books with my students. And she's talking about our children's picture books, but there are also picture books that are designed especially for older audiences. So these are growing in popularity for middle school and high school library collections. They cover a range of genres. They cover writing strategies. They are helpful to struggling readers or English language learners. Examples are Pink and Say by Patricia Polacco and books by Eve Bunting. One example is The Wall. I will tell you that Eve Bunting is a prolific writer for children and young adults, and also does a lot of writing of the Orca Soundings books. I don't know if you're familiar with those. I don't think they're the, like, the highest quality, but they're another example of high-low readers that you might want to know about um, 
and you might want to know about E. Bunting in particular just because she writes a ton. And so if you're looking for books that are accessible to kids who don't read well, E. Bunting is a great example. Um, and also using picture books is a great example. I will tell you I had a student come in and say, I have to read the Canterbury Tales in my English class. She was a lower level senior. Um, and we had an illustrated Canterbury Tales um, illustrated by Trina Shart Hyman. If you're not familiar with her as an illustrator, she's fabulous. Anyway, this girl checked out the Illustrated Canterbury Tales, and I have the feeling it will help her a great deal. And I thought it was awesome that she was willing to check out the illustrated book, but I told her to share the book with her English teacher so that other students could benefit from it, because I think they will. Okay, so if you're interested in using picture books with tweens or teens or even adults, you might want to investigate this book from Libraries Unlimited. It's called Picture That. The author is Sharon L. McElmeal. This one was published in 2009, though she has several other editions, renditions, um, expansions on this title. Anyway, it's an invaluable resource, resource with many suggestions with space for recording, connecting ideas and strategies to infuse literacy into every area of the curriculum in classrooms and libraries with older readers. So there you go. Um, I will tell you that I do have a collection in my high school library of picture books. Um, my justification for this collection is one, I use them with students and we read to the kids across the street. We do have students in my high school who have children. Um, I don't recommend that if you're 17, don't have a kid. But anyway, um, I have students with children and I have faculty members with children. And I had a, I checked out a new picture book to one of my faculty members. He's like, I didn't realize you had these. And I'm like, yes, yes. I'm trying to make sure that even my faculty members are reading to their children because it is just so important. So we also teach teacher cadet at my high school, and the teacher cadet students have to evaluate some uh, picture books, small chapter books, and then tween books and young adult books as they progress through teacher cadet. So it's nice to have a variety of reading levels and resources in my library. Though I will tell you that my collection for picture books is only about 200 books. So pop culture has had a large influence on young adult literature. Uh, one example would be TTYL for by Lauren Miracle that came out in 2004. That means talk to you later if you're not up on the lingo. I'm, of course, up on the lingo because I have a teenager helping me out. Um, this was the first ever novel written entirely in the style of instant messaging conversation. It is on the ALA's Most Challenged Books list. It's on Sylvie's 500 Great Books for Teens. It has sequels. The two sequels are TTFN, which means Tata for Now. I knew that without asking. And Later Gator. I have not read those. I did um, sometime in the far, far past read TTYL. Don't ask me about it. I don't remember. I know I read it. Um, and I have not read the sequels. But um, these are books that are obviously impacted by pop culture. And of course, you guys, hopefully you can think of some others. All right, so here's where I believe we're probably getting into a bit of an historical lesson. Magazines. A survey of students in 30 countries, including the U.S. and Canada, found magazines and newspapers topping the list of preferred reading material for both boys and girls, with comic books being the second choice for boys. That's from 2002. I would be willing to bet that the preferred reading material for young adults now would be something on their phones, which would include multimedia, not just a magazine. It would have video clips including text, something like that. Anyway, the availability of this soft literature may be what results in choose, children choosing to read rather than choosing not to read at all. This is also from 2002. I am on multiple listservs, I will tell you, um, the Future Ready Librarians. There is often a discussion of whether or not libraries should continue to have magazines. Um, my argument is... If you don't have the magazines, they sure as heck are not going to read them. 
So I do keep magazines in my library. I do not keep research magazines in my library, um, which is not totally true. I do keep National Geographic in my library, but it's because I like to read the articles and my history teachers use them. So I will tell you, I got stuck subbing or we didn't have enough subs and I got, uh, I frequently get sets of kids, like I'll get eight kids who don't have any place to go because there's no sub. And sometimes they have something to do, but sometimes they don't. I always offer them magazines. I will tell you out of eight kids, two or three will take the magazines. If I did not have the magazines to offer, they would not read them. So you're going to have to make the decisions in your library. You might decide it's not worth your money to buy magazines if they're not getting read frequently. Fortunately, I have enough of a budget. So up to you. I think if the magazines are there and you make them available, they will get read sometimes. So I think that's better than the kids not reading at all or having their heads buried in their phones constantly. Again, you're going to have to make these calls in your library based on your budget, your time, um, and what you see the habits of your patrons are. All right, so I'm going to go over zines, and we're going to count this as a bit of an historical um, lesson. It's an abbreviation for fanzines or magazine. Uh, started becoming popular in the 60s. These are small circulation, self-published, self-expression. Topics include music, art, politics, sexuality, personal experience, travel, etc. The majority are produced in editions of less than a thousand. Profit is not the intent of publication. They are issued independently and usually produced using desktop publishing and photocopiers. There is a zine wiki that you can click on when I get the PowerPoint posted for you. So if you're interested in zines or have a history with them, you might want to poke around and look at that. I do want to let you know that my 16 year old son says that zines are no longer a thing with teenagers though he is a sporty spice and not into like the club scene or bands so that may be part of why he is not aware of zines or does not see that as part of the culture um it's my sense that zines are also sort of passe and that most things have moved to a digital platform and that information is shared with blogs, wikis, web pages, Facebook, Instagram. There's a bunch of other stuff that I'm sure I don't know about. Anyway, um, I think that people build a sense of community or fan zine type, share that type of information in a digital platform more than a small print platform. All right, I want to make sure you know about the Yalsa Alex Awards. This award began in 2002. Hopefully, by this time in your um, degree in library science, you've browsed everything on uh, the ALA website and Yalsa's website. But anyway, just a reminder, the Alex Award is for adult books for young adults. So it is awarded to 10 books written for adults that have special appeal to young adults ages 12 through 18. It is selected from the previous year's publications. It's named for Margaret Edwards, who was called Alex by her friends. Um, I will tell you in browsing the 2018 list, I haven't read anything on it yet. I feel like a complete slacker. However, as I look at the list, I want to read absolutely everything there. Um, including this title, The Clockwork Dynasty by Daniel Wilson. Um, there are two automata, Elena and Peter. They are born, that's in quotation marks, in Peter the Great's Russia, or are they? Can they live in the power-hungry world of humans, or can they find the breath of life before it's too late? Ooh, I totally want to, um, totally want to read that. There are others on here. Many of them are fantasy. It seems fantasy is huge right now. Um, but there are a couple of realistic fiction on here also. So uh, it just, it's a great list. Another way to do collection development. It's another way to make sure that you have a wide variety of reading levels in your library, not just the low level, but the high level. But some of these are also easy reads. So make sure you check out the Alex Award list. 
And if you're in a library that has a limited selection and have some money, of course, look at previous lists. Make sure you've got those too. You can go back until 2002. Quick reminders, assignments coming up. Please read chapters 16 and 17 in your textbook. You want to read information on the Teen Services Competencies website. That is in our weekly content this week. Your final literature logs are due by midnight on Thursday, December 6th, and that assignment slot is up under assignments that is available to you now. So if you're all done with your lit logs, you can get them in. Those, if you get them in, I won't look at them tomorrow. Um, I won't start looking until this weekend probably, but if you get them in, I will try to grade them as they come in. I will try to finalize grades as fast as I possibly can so that you guys aren't waiting on tenter hooks for your grades. Um, I apologize that some, some of you early in the alphabet, the A, Bs, and some of the Cs got a little delayed because I had guests for Thanksgiving and was exhausted by turkey cooking. So, okay, so that stuff's coming up. I will also be putting up um, one more discussion that is optional and that you can comment on the final chapters in the book. If you felt like you missed one of the discussions or got it up kind of late and you want to make sure you got the points for that, I will make that available to you. It is not required, just an opportunity to make up a point or two. Questions, please email. Um, you guys have been good about emailing me questions. I appreciate that. I am pretty good at responding to email. So again, havercam at email.sc.edu. That's how you can get a hold of me, and I will try to respond quickly. I do try to get logged into USC's email, but if it's a question that I feel like is pressing and I need to get back to you quickly, sometimes I will respond from my Yahoo. I hope you do not mind. I just want to make sure you get a quick answer. So questions, email me. I hope you guys are doing well. Uh, let me know if you've got questions, and I will talk to you. We'll have something up probably very brief next week, since you'll be finishing up your literature log. I will make sure that the optional discussion post is up by tomorrow if you want to post something. And once again, you can turn in your lit logs at any time until the 6th. All right. Take care. I hope you guys are doing well. Bye.